Hi, and welcome to module 13 in lecture one. In this relatively short module, we're gonna focus pretty tightly on a really important topic in statistics um, and in research design and methods in general, which is the difference between populations and samples. Populations are any well-defined set of units of analysis. They are theoretically determined. They're determined by your theory and the scope conditions on your theory. In other words, the population that's relevant to testing your theory is the population of units, whether they be countries or states or localities or people or whatever, or group, subgroups of people. The population that you specified when you made your theory that your theory applies to. So if you said your theory applies to all people making political decisions across the entire world, the population is all people who ever make political decisions across the entire world. In contrast, if your population is individuals living in North Carolina this year, that's your population, right? This is all determined by the theory that you put forward. Samples um, are drawn from this theoretically determined population. The population can be big or small, but it's often bigger than you can reasonably take data on. In some cases, that's not true. So if your population are countries, um, you can often get data on all the countries in the world for certain, in certain cases, in which case you have the entire population of data that's relevant to you. That's great. But in a lot of cases, you just simply can't get data on all the members of your population. So if your population are all citizens of voting age in the U.S., that is many, that's many millions of people. So because of that, you're not going to go out and ask every one of those millions of people their opinions. So instead, what you do is you take a sample from the population. The trick here is we want to use those samples to estimate qualities of the population as a whole. Typically, we're going to, re we're going to um, discuss or characterize our population by its parameters, things like the, its mean, the standard deviation of its variables. We're going to want, in general, to measure those things on the sample we take and then use those measurements to estimate the same types of, types of parameters on the population. That's our actual goal. We only ever care about the population for real, but we only ever see the sample, usually. Um, in general, the bigger the sample you can get, the closer you can get to the entire population, the more accurate is your estimate. It's intuitive, right? So if I had a sample comprising everyone in the whole world, or everyone in my population, I'd be exactly right. My sample estimate would be exactly equal to my population estimate because I have the entire population. Usually though, um, the sample is much smaller than the population, maybe a thousand people out of 200 million people, in which case you're going to have error associated with the estimate you get from the sample, simply because the, the sample you draw might not be exactly a microcosm of the entire population. It might not be perfectly representative of the entire population, and those differences might lead to error in your estimates. So again, the bigger the sample, the more accurate you are, the smaller your sampling error is, but there's always going to be some kind of sampling error until you get the entire population. To see how this works, let's talk about a particular example. Um, this is a survey um, asking the question, who is, you know, trying to answer the question that we might have if we lived in Florida in 2010 as to who is leading the race for governor that year. Ideally, we would ask every single person in Florida who is leading that race. That's not very practical, though. Um, it's very costly. So instead, as typical, surveys quite often happened, asking a subset of the population um, what they thought who they who they would support and this is the result these are the results for a poll september 15th 2010 indicating a slight lead for scott um so let's dig deeper into that actual survey that actual sample and see what it means well the survey said it surveyed 600 registered florida voters okay so 600 is, is it's much smaller than the population of registered voters in florida and the margin of error it provided for us was plus or minus four percentage points. So what's a margin of error? Well, a margin of error in this case tells you the, the sampling error. The error you get in your estimate based on the fact that you've only surveyed 600 people and not the entire population. As that number gets bigger, that sampling error goes gets smaller. And if you've ever read a, uh, any kind of um, survey or poll in, in, in the news, you might have seen in this fine print in the bottom Sampling error. 
it's often about 3% because 3% is associated with about 1,000 um, voters, 1,000 individuals, which is a common sampling number, common, um, common size of sample. So in this case, what that margin of error means is that our estimate for the population support is plus or minus 4%, which if you go back here, that means that we think SYNC has support somewhere between 41 and 49% in the real in the whole population, and Scott had support between 43 and 51% in the entire population. Now that overlaps substantially, and that's what, what leads to what we call sometimes a statistical tie. It means we can't quite be sure who is leading because the difference between their, their, their support is within the margin of error. That said, the survey still allows us to estimate the level of the support of each candidate, even with the uncertainty involved. So even though it's not perfect, and in this case doesn't tell us who the population supports with certainty, we only get that by actually measuring the entire population, it does give us a numerical characterization of our error. It tells us exactly how much error we have, which is very useful for understanding how well we know things. So in this case, it's a 2% difference with a 4% margin of error. Um, we might not be very confident in our estimates there. If we inched it up to, say, a 3% difference with a 3.1% margin of error, now it's getting close enough that we might feel more confident. If we had a 4% difference with a 2% margin of error, we might now say, okay, we think the population um, supports one or the other candidate, with a reasonably high degree of, of confidence. Taking the stuff we just did here and providing actual confidence levels to our estimates is gonna be the object of the stuff we do um, as the course goes on. And it's important because as scientists, we wanna not just say you know, what we think is happening, we wanna tell people how much we believe what we are saying and how much they can believe us, right? So that as I said before, it's not that if they see we're wrong once, that suddenly our, all stuff goes out the window, but rather we want people to understand that our, our, our estimates come with error and they should take that into account when they use the estimates for making plans themselves. Okay. Um, so again, given the sample we just saw, we can't say who's winning necessarily. If those were the population numbers, then we would say Scott was winning because at the time, Scott had two more percentage points. If the, if the whole population thought that, that would tell you with perfect precision what the population thought. Okay. So that's it for this. Um, we're going to now do a little bit of, of, of math background that can help us understand the next few um, parts of the course. Thank you very much.